Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, as far as I can see in the room are only people familiar with geophysics. So I hope that at least anybody online will be interested or is not familiar, familiar with uh, the geophysical method. Methods. Uh, first of all, I should introduce myself. My, my name is Erosa Pirku. There was a little change in, in the schedule. First, we decided to switch with my colleagues. I represent our company, Jeanbus Prague. We are a small Prague based geophysical company. We do mainly near surface geophysics. And the scope of my talk is mainly to introduce. Uh, the basics of geophysical, geophysical methods to give you an, uh, a quick overview of the geophysical methods and a couple of special methods which are named as uh, the building diagnostics or diagnostical methods, which I believe might be used uh, might be useful for the BIM as well. So I would just like to say in the beginning that the the scope of this presentation does. Uh, uh, it's mainly for people who are not fam familiar with the geophysics at all. So if there are geophysicists among you, you will not see anything new for you. So the geophysical methods, generally speaking, are methods using physical, field, physical fields and its interaction with the environment, generally speaking, with the geological environment. Uh, we can use them as a ground-based, which is the main part. We can use them as the airborne or in the wells or in water as well. Uh, I would like to count a couple advantages and a couple disadvantages of geophysical methods. So regarding the advantages, we can say that the main advantage, main pros is that the geophysical methods are generally non-destructive, which means that when applying them to the environment, we do not need to dig anything, we do not need to open any drill holes. So, uh, and uh, comparing to drill holes, they're a little cheaper. And if you imagine a, a drill hole, which brings you an information only for one particular place, uh, with a geophysical survey, you can continue the information between the drill holes. You can have continuous information along the profile. Uh, with geophysics, we can cover a broad range of applications all the way from the environmental issues to small-scale special problems like forensic or building diagnostics. What's important to say that in the BIM we can use the geophysics all the way from, from the preparation stage before the building construction, during the construction and after the construction as well. I will show you an example of the continuous measurement which we call uh, geophysical monitoring to, to observe the changes in the building constructions uh, during their life cycle. Uh, the disadvantages are apparent, I believe. All the, myth, all the measurements are based on the indirect measurements from the, mainly from the, from the surface. So what we are getting is actually just a picture um, and the way the geological env environment interacts with the physical fields. So, as I said, uh, the, the drill holes are only point-based, are only point information, and comparing to the geophysics, they bring a direct information from the environment. Geophysics brings only indirect information from the surface or uh, depending on the, on the measurement from the air or from the water. There is also a, uh, a basic problem with the so-called ambiguity of the results, which is basic mathematical fact that you can have many theoretically correct inverted models, but comparing to the geological picture, only one is correct. So with the basic example, for as a basic example, this would be probably a case when you are searching for something very big and very deep, or you are searching for something very small and very sh you know, in, uh, in shallow depth. And the inverted picture of these two bodies could be completely the same. So the, the models would be theoretically correct, but you are not able to distinguish if it's something really shallow or something really deep. 
And that's because of the so-called ambiguity of the results. And that's a principal problem uh, connected with the math mathematical basement of the methods. And probably are, the methods are, can, be this, uh, can be divided into methods that are pretty fast and you can cover a large area. Uh, but the level of detail is not so big, and then some of the methods where you, are, you need to get a large detail and you need to get a lot of uh, deep information, they usually have slow working tempo. So I'd like to talk generally about geophysical methods first, which can be uh, divided, generally speaking, into five groups, as you can see on the slide. Uh, generally, we can divide the geophys geophysical methods according to a couple of criteria, uh, like uh, in this case where we can distinguish between active and passive methods. That means if we need to generate something actively or we are using something which is existing uh, without our existence. That means like in case of magnetometry when we are using the Earth magnetic field. And in the end of my talk, I would like to briefly talk about uh, so-called building diagnostic methods which are generally special cases of geophysical methods. So first of all, geoelectrics, geoelectrics or geoelectrical methods, very big group of geophysical techniques, which either use direct or alternate current, or in some special cases can also be passive using the earth currents, the, the currents, eddy currents in the earth. Uh, there are a lot of particular methods, but I will be talking only about the modern one, which is called multi-electrode resistivity tomography, or electrical resistivity, tom electric resistivity tomography, abbreviated to the ERT. Uh, the basics of these methods are in the Ohm's law. Uh, generally speaking, we have many electrodes along the profile, and then we are getting, say, hundreds of measured resistivity points per cross section and in the end the results the result of this of such a measurement looks like this that means we have a cross section of apparent resistivity apparent resistivity is very use uh, usable parameter parameter because uh, it uh, reacts to a lot of things it changes with petro petrological type of rock it changes with the level of weathering of the rock as you can see here on the picture, there is a cross section over, uh, over erosion channel. So on the right side, you can see a limestone bedrock, which generally has higher resistivities around 1000 ohm meters. And on the left side, you can see we have the erosional channel, which is electrically conductive. That means that the sediments are better electric conductors. And this information is confirmed by the information from the drill holes, as you can see on the picture. Uh, the advantage, advantage of the ERT method is that it has a wide spectrum of applications. The disadvantage is that it's quite slow comparing to some walkable methods, and it cannot be used, say, in the cities or in the urban areas, because as it's using the direct, cur direct current it's also sensitive to any artificial conductors like cables, wires, et, uh, et cetera. Uh, speaking about this, I would like to also show you the results of something which is quite popular in recent years, which is so-called monitoring. That means we are using the geophysics to, to describe the processes in the geologic medium. Like in this case, you can see, this is a picture from the old closed uranium mine where we are monitoring the processes in the rock. You can see that it's, it's a hard rock, it's pretty solid. And uh, from the first side, it seems like there are no processes at all. But because I told you that the resistivity is pretty sensitive parameter to a lot of things, we can see on, on this video, which covers around one year of measurements, uh, that there's some slight changes. Oh, it's, it seems like I'm having the same problem like my German colleague. 
So you, you will not probably see the end of the video, but there were two things on the video. The first one is there are two, two types of anomalies on the video in this solid hard rock environment. Uh, the first one, there were, there were some rapid changes. They were artificially made by pumping the water into the massive, which changed the resistivities rapidly during the course of one, around one week. And uh, another type of anomaly, another type of anomaly on this picture were not that visible, it was not that visible, but we found out that in the hard rock environment, there was a strong one week period in the massive, probably caused by the man-made by the man-made activities. So even in the even in, in the environment of hard rocks, the things like ventilation and stuff can influence the massive and can be visible on the repeated uh, resistivity measurements. I will skip this uh, to another method, which in this case belongs to the geoelectrics as well, but it is using uh, the alternate current. It's generating the electromagnetic field and it's called a ground penetrating radar. It's quite popular today because uh, even a lot of people from like geography and morphology decided to use it. Uh, it's generally speaking, it's using high frequency electromagnetic signal, which is emitted to the environment. And then depending on the boundaries on the so-called reflection boundaries, reflection boundaries, we can either distinguish on the geological structures or on man-made structures. Usually these sharp, sharp like reflections are made by stuff like pipes, well, like cables. Uh, <laughs> the advantage of this method is that you can cover a huge area in a short amount of time. The, the, myth, the method can be pretty swift and the measurement can be in large detail. But the general problem with the GPR is the depth of information because the depth of information is strongly based on the conductivity of the subsoil. And especially in the Czech Republic, the subsoil is usually electrically conductive and it mutes the GPR signal quite strongly. So usually you're not able to get deeper information than say four to five meters with the GPR. Another huge uh, branch of method is seismics. Uh, the most money that comes from seismics is connected to so-called so reflection in seismics because it is used for oil and gas, uh, oil and gas survey. But I'm not going to talk about this today because I'm uh, concentr concentrating more to, uh, to the engineering problems. So seismics is using uh, the artificially generated seismic waves. Mm -hmm. They can be artificially generated by hammer, sparkers, vibrators, or we can use also the passive signal like noise from the cities, noise from the cars, or earthquakes as well. Depending on the, the parameters of the seismic waves, we can guess mainly on the structures on the ground like on the thickness of, of the overburden, uh, the depth of the bedrock and, and its quality. And that means that the general connection, general dependence between the seismic velocity and, uh, the, and the way the, the structure of bedrock is that as the velocity goes higher, uh, the bedrock is harder and harder. So we can guess on the state of the bedrock, if it's pretty solid or if it's uh, disrupted by uh, some vertical structures like faults, etc. Uh, obviously, this method is pretty use, usable in the early stages of building, uh, building constructions because usually uh, you need to know how deep the bedrock is 
this and what uh, what's the state of stress of the bedrock. Uh, there are apparent det detection limits corresponding to the, to the wavelength of the seismic waves, because if the wavelength is too big, that it will simply skip skips the uh, the structures you are interested in. And there, it can be, uh, there can be problems if you are measuring the seismic in the cities, especially in the cities, because you're, uh, apparently you're using the seismic waste, which can be generated also by, by people, which is source of noise for you, for your measurements. Uh, another method is gravimetry. Gravimetry is a special method which measures which measures tiny variations in the earth gravity field. And these tiny variations are mainly related to the density variations, which is pretty useful, usable for us because density variations could mean also cavities and uh, uh, or voids. So this, the, the instruments that are used for the gravimetry are called gravimeters. Technically speaking, they are very precise scales. And the gravimetry is the only geophysical method that can directly indicate the density reduction. As I was showing to you the picture of the GPR, the GPR is very often used for, for detecting cavities as, as, cavities as well, but it's pretty hard to distinguish the anomalies from each other. If you combine the gravimetry and GPR, then you can tell, yes, this GPR anomaly probably indicates uh, the cavity. Like you can see on the example up there, we have a general gra uh, gravity field and the negative anomalies indicate the holes or uh, the channels or cavities. And similarly to, to the seismic, the, uh, the dis disadvantage of this method is again the sensitivity, sensitivity to the noise. Because I, I was I was saying the gravimeters are, technically speaking, very precise scale. They are so precise that the signal from the noise can be stronger than the signal from the anomalies you are searching for. Another method, magnetometry, it's a little bit different to, to the seismics and to, to the geoelectrical methods in terms that it's using something which is existing without uh, without our presence. It's using only variations of the Earth magnetic field, so you don't need to generate anything. And it's, uh, it's using, it's based on the interaction of the Earth magnetic field with the objects uh, that are inser inserted into the field. So apparently the magnetometry can be mainly used for searching for metal objects because they are making the strongest anomalies. Uh, again, we have the problem in the cities because especially in the modern cities, we have a lot of metal uh, artificial objects, metal man-made objects. Uh, what's pretty good about magnetometry is the swiftness of the methods. It can be pretty fast, especially in the UXO surveys, which is unexplored ordnance surveys. You can cover a couple hectares per day and get uh, very good information on presence of bombs or shells or these types uh, of objects. Radiometry, that's again, it can, it can be active method, but it can be also passive method. Passive method is usually based on uh, describing the radiometric properties of the subsoil. That's usually the direct indication, indication of uranium, potassium, potassium, and thorium. But we can also use the active approach, which is if we have, say, cesium, for instance, and or beryllium, and then we are trying to, to use the interaction of these elements with the material to get on, say, density of material, porosity of the material. That can be used as well. But apparently, the main uh, uh, the main use of the radiometry is in geologic mapping and in searching for uh, radioactive elements. And again, the, this method can be very, can have a, a high precision, but it's rather slow if you require high precision. It's generally speaking, are one, one 
and half minute per measured point. Uh, in the end of my presentation, I would like to, to cover a couple special methods, which are generally connected with the geophysical methods. In this case, the radiant risk, uh, it belongs to the radiometric methods, but it's one of the methods that is, according to the Czech law, compulsory for any new building. Uh, radon is radioactive soil gas. It's one of the product of the uranium decay. And depending on the geological settings, the radon risk can be high or low. As you can see on the map, uh, the colors go from low risk to the high risk. And you can see that geologically, usually the sedimentary basins have lower risk, while uh, the crystalline rocks or the the igneous rocks, they have high risk. And the way this measurement is carried out is on this picture, is described on this picture. And we take out the, the soil gas and then we put it in the, in the chamber when the soil gas is being, is being described uh, depending on the level of the radon in it. Another method, uh, another special method which we are using and which is connected to the geoelectrics is called corrosion survey or a spray current survey. Uh, it's uh, pretty common in all cities in our countries where you have dense network of trams or railways and or, or subways. And it's based on the fact that usually uh, the DC sources of of these trams or railways, uh, there's all, always some or small portion of the electricity of the current that leaks outside from the uh, from from the wires, and that it can damage it can cause damage to the metal elements like bridges, lamps, or building foundations. So what we do uh, in the survey is that we first measure the activity of the soil voltage. And then also we measure the resistivity of the subsoil. And the rule of thumb is if the subsoil is electrically conductive, it's worse for us and then can be high risk of, um, of this corrosion. And generally speaking in the Czech Republic, we minimally have the mid risk everywhere apart from the mountains area because uh, we have pretty dense network of, of railways, of the trams, etc. So it's pretty common to to perform to carry out uh, such a measurement in the early stage of building preparation. Uh, technical se seismicity, I will not be speaking about this very much because the next speaker will cover this. Yeah. It's part of the seismic methods, but it's using it's usually using the passive low frequency seismic signals, and the result of the te technical seismicity measurements is to consider the level of impact of the vibration to the constructions, which can be caused by uh, quarry detonations, as you will hear in about two, uh, I think two talks, from the transportation at et cetera. And the last method I would like to talk about is again a special seismic method, which is called PIT, Pile Integration Test. And it's one of the methods which describes the materials uh, generally the concrete piles where you can use the high frequency seismic waves to detect uh, defects in the piles. But as you can see, there can be problems because uh, very often the geophysical signal goes the easiest way. That means in case of geoelectrics, it goes through the conductors. And in case of seismics, it goes through, through the best part of the body. So you can see that you are able to detect a major defect while PIT, but you can you might not be able to detect uh, stuff like necking or bulging because the the seismic wave will simply go through the best part of of the body and uh, will not consider the rest, which is a general aspect of geophysical methods. I would like to conclude with a couple of points. Hopefully I showed you the general overview of the geophysical methods and the way as uh, they can contribute to the BIM. 
Uh, I showed you the picture of the 4D measurements, which is pretty modern these days, where you can, if you have precise, intact geometry, you can describe the processes in, in the medium or in the environment. The main advantage is they are non-invasive and they are bringing the continuous information along the profile comparing to the drill holes. The main theoretical disadvantage is the ambiguity of surface methods or of inverted models, as I said. And we can have methods that are pretty quick. Uh, the, the swiftness of the basic method is pretty fast. And then later on, if you need some large detail, you can use the advanced one, advanced methods uh, to get uh, a better information about the medium. And I will conclude with this. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm pleased to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting contribution. And there are any questions? Yes. I would like to ask you, uh, you mentioned that uh, your GPR measurements are accessible or successful only up to four meters. Yeah. Is it mm. true? Is no, I, I was speaking about like 400 megahertz antenna, which is the common one. Uh, apparently, if we are using 100 megahertz antenna, we can go deeper, but you, the size of the objects must be bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it was generalized. I, I was right, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's true. Thanks. Next questions. If not, then thank you very much. And I ask the second speaker, Professor Kalab, with contribution, natural and technical vibrations, measurements, interpretation, evaluation. Please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, ladies, not ladies here, but maybe internet and gentlemen. Uh, my topic is natural and technical vibration, some information about measurement, interpretation, and evaluation. Uh, currently, I am president of the Czech Association of Geophysicists. If you will need some information, more detailed or some maybe discussion with geophysics with our expert please ask me and i will uh, i give you contact for experts that is possible to uh, discuss with uh, you about maybe about your physical problems how to solve the problems and so on currently i am at the institute of geonics czech academy of sciences and partly at the technical university of ostrava faculty of civil engineering this is short outline about my presentation. What is necessary to say? It is not comprehensive study about these topics. It is only some notes, some general notes about problems that we usually use when we discuss about seismicity. I suppose that it is not necessary to discuss about individual point. I will start. Okay, we know that uh, vibration is a dynamic quantity. It was discussed that beam is especially about the structure on the surface, but also it is necessary to take into account partly that is under the ground. It means geo-environmental or geological environment and according to me because i am catastrophic man it is also processing it's not only air squeaks of course it is fluid uh, fluids and so on and so on just now i will discuss only about vibra vibration uh, to evaluate measured vibration it is necessary to see for several several factors that is necessary to take into account, especially it is not 
general information about seismic signals. But if we discuss about structures, about buildings, it is resonant frequencies of this structure or especially significant component of this structure. This is a very important point because usually engineers only ask for general information about earthquakes, about artificial seismicity and so on. But it is not so much important like combination, this information with resonant frequencies of this significant components or maybe structure at all. Of course, it is several points that is necessary to take also into account. If we combine all this, we obtain some information about influence of vibration, of structure, or maybe on the environment, maybe on the, on the people, and so on and so on. If we discuss about structures, currently in Europe, we use standard Euro, Euro code A, that is very precise information how to design structure for x resistance. resistant. But it also exists national standard in individual countries that is also necessary to take into account. For example, just now we are in Czech, we have national standard, we have Eurocode, but if company from Germany prepared some maybe structure or buy something, he asked not according this, but according German standards like them. Therefore, it is necessary at the beginning to ask which type of standard will be used for this given problem. If we discuss about vibration, we have two types of vibration. Natural vibrations, usually it is earthquake. Different type of earthquake depends on the origin. And if we discuss about earthquakes, it is problem that journalists and also many people that are not from this branch discuss and changes terms, magnitudes, maybe seismic moments, intensity, and so on. Therefore, if you will discuss about influence of earthquakes, ask which type of maybe scale will be used for definition of impact. If it was, if it is some type of magnitude, maybe some seismic moment and so on. If we discuss about artificial source, it means it is partly technical seismicity as discussed Yaroslav, maybe some blastings, drillings, vibration machines and so on. And of course, it is also some information from the mining induced seismicity seismicity induced by feeling of large dams and so on and so on. The problem is that if we discuss about wave patterns of natural vibrations and artificial vibrations, the parameters could be quite different. It is necessary to see not only for amplitude, but also for frequency, range, spectrums, and so on and so on. To evaluate vibration and influence of vibration on structure, usually it is proposed these seven points, how to evaluate at the beginning, of course, determination of acceptable load of the structure. Because maybe this is 
common building, maybe that is historic building, and so on and so on. Then some prognosis of load, depending, of course, of the type of source, maybe earth beef, maybe artificial, and so on. Then determination of risk. It is very important point because owner of this building asked if it is okay from this type of source on, uh, and predominant frequencies and so on and so on. Next, it is description of filers, including photographs. We have several, several types of buildings with damages, with fires, and everybody said this is due to vibration. But absolutely no. According to my position, about maybe five up to ten percent the source of these problems on the buildings are vibration. The rest are problems with the soils, with the structures, and so on and so on. Of course, very important point, measurement of seismic effect. After that, evaluation of safety for the measured load and so on. And if it is necessary, it continues some problems, maybe buildings is need of query. It is necessary to monitor existing fissures, fires at the building. A few words about measurement. Uh, the first is that according standards and also according Eurocode 8, we have so-called reference stations. It means it is placed for sensors, for seismometers, and usually it is in the background of this structure. We know that the response of buildings, especially if this is high building, is much, much greater. But for the evaluation of influence, it is necessary to use, measure, of source vibration. It means measurement at the ground of this building. If we discuss about interpretation, very shortly, we have Eurocode, and according to Eurocode, we have three main points that is necessary to take into account to be without risk of problems with buildings, with people, and so on, and so on. Of course, including damage of structures, maybe protection, civil protection remains operational, and so on, and so on. To take into account this Eurocode, as is uh, uh, written, also soil characteristics and criteria that the foundation source and financial system of structure must meet in design of seismic events. Because quite different information you obtain for the same earthquake, for the same source, if it is one type of soil, maybe hard rock and so on, in the surrounding of the building. To evaluate vibration, Everybody know just now, we can, you, every one week, we discuss about very strong events, very strong earthquake, maybe some tsunamis and so on. This is only table about the 10, the most intensive earthquakes in the world, starting from the Brazil, 1960, 9.5, and going up, up to Sumatra, that was about 10 or something like this. What is uh, important? 
important is that we know that these earthquakes can occur only in maybe areas when we know that it is some problems with concentration of strain. If yes, then it could start some bigger or maybe most int intensive event. Because just now it is discussion, if there is more and more earthquakes, I can say, no, it is not true. It is only due uh, the fact that we have TV, we have mobiles, and so on and so on. And of course, we also have very densely uh, situations around the world. Just now in the world, it's more than 3,000 seismic stations that are collected in one. And therefore, we have many, many information about the earthquakes. Now, because time is going very quickly, uh, two short case studies. The first, natural seismicity in the medieval mine. It's very old mine from the 15th century, really very nice uh, near the Sokolov city. Partly it is uh, just now possible to uh, go inside like a tourist. Uh, because it is about five, uh, 25 kilometers from the Novi Kostel Focal Zone, where occurred uh, very intensive seismic activity. It, is, it was necessary also to start some maybe information how is influence of vibration of this very old mine, very old underground space. After 20 years, we obtain something like this. It is frequency range, amplitude, and information about different types of sources, starting from queries and going up to maybe as weeks with the magnitude 5.0 or something like this that is possible to occur in this focal zone. You can also see, as I said at the beginning, that it is not problem only with the amplitude, but also problem with the frequency. If we discuss about maybe individual structure, of course, natural structures or artificial structure in the mind, you can see for response if it is one hertz or maybe about 100 hertz as source of this vibration in this. Why I discuss about this? Because just now we have using specific instruments and using uh, not only this, but uh, also other information. Uh, we have information how it is uh, influence of vibration of this type of structure at first and at second at type of this type of old of this structure of the age just now we discuss about maybe preparing some maybe stories and how it will be after 100 years 200 years this is answered we know how it is some problems with vibration, maybe of course many, many others, but I don't, uh, I uh, have not time to discuss about this. The second case study is discussion about seismic stability. We used different type of methodologies, starting about analysis of historical data, then started about current and of course prognosis. This is information about Current situation may be about, I don't know, about 25 years. Information, uh, it is not C, but it is Czech Republic, 
and some information about different type of vibrations, big parts. This is mining induced seismicity from the uh, upper Silesian coal basin and uh, Polkovic Lubin coal basin, and of course, natural earthquakes from the Alps. And the other the, uh, the question was how it will be in the next years, next hundred years, and so on. We use for this so called neo deterministic approach to prepare very specific concept of scenarios based on the given earthquakes. At this time, we use some earthquake from the uh, 1590, that was about maybe seven points something. And it was used as the example of the possible sort that was influenced this. And this is according uh, seismological viewpoint, different type, how it will be possible to discuss about possible, uh, maybe information of influence of uh, ground acceleration. About conclusion, as I said, if we discuss about processes that influence on structure, on environment, at first it is necessary recognition of this problem. Therefore, use control monitoring, documentation, and of course, diagnostic, how it will be. And the last, information that if we discuss about this problem with the geological environment about processes, everybody knows that it is very complicated problem due to nature, and therefore, we used only maybe very hard information, but very complex information about this. Thank you for attention. And thank you very much for interesting contribution. And are there any questions? Thank you one more. No question. Thank you very much. And we can start with the third one. Pavel Pospíšil, geophysical measurements, necessary basement for geobim preparation. So, uh, gentlemen in this room and uh, potentially ladies and gentlemen remotely uh, who are connected, to this conference uh, through the computers. So uh, I would like to continue with the topic of the geophysical measurements and uh, uh, how they are necessary uh, as a basement for, I can say, the geo beam, so the combination of the geographical, uh, geodetical, geological information uh, about the ground for the construction of some building. And uh, I would like to focus um, your attention to the preparation of those uh, combined models. Yes. Uh, the outline of my presentation is at first the introduction, uh, the comparison of the uh, abbreviation of the BIM, so the building information versus the geo BIM, so the geo information and the building information. Uh, so some uh, words about the building modeling uh, and uh, the rock environmental modeling and uh, two case studies very briefly about uh, the geophysical measurements at the castle in Klimkovice in Czech Republic and the football stadium of Basel in Ostrava and some conclusions. So uh, what about the in introduction of this topic? Yes. When I prepared these um, presentations, so I would like to focus um, uh, on the BIM as an abbreviation uh, 
which is a comprehensive uh, formulation of the uh, geometrical characterization of the structures and, of course, the parametrical, uh, parametrical characterization of the structures. And, of course, uh, these, uh, I think, the BIM models are developed very well in the world. And, of course, uh, the GeoBIM, in the case, I can save the uh, information about the ground, yes, uh, underneath the structures, is uh, not so developed, uh, but developed in combination, yes, in combination uh, in a focusing on the structure engineering, because uh, as you will see, uh, many of the softwares uh, that are developed for the geological interpretation of uh, those data. And uh, of course, uh, the problem is uh, in what stage we can use uh, the integration of those data, uh, of these data uh, for the uh, specific, uh, I think, epochs or the stages of the construction, before the construction, during construction, and after the construction, during the maintenance of the structure. At first, uh, the comparison of the building information modeling versus the geo building information modeling. Yes. The first one is uh, focused only on the structure itself. Yes. So it means mostly upper structures. Yes. Uh, sometimes also for the foundation of the structure. While the geo beam is uh, the integration uh, of the information about the ground. Yes. So the rock environment generally. Uh, which is in contact or can influence the quality of the structure. And uh, it should be done by the uh, interpretation of the boreholes or drill holes, yes. Uh, on, or we can use also the continuous information in profiles or in three-dimensional information uh, by the geophysical measurement. Uh, which is very, very useful, especially in uh, places, for example, in urban places where you cannot drill there, but you can measure, yes, uh, as a indirect uh, obtaining of the information. Uh, about the structure modeling, yes, which is called the BIM abbreviation. So uh, I think that uh, you know very well, too, I think the essential companies, Autodesk and Bentley, uh, who are uh, combinating uh, the information. Yes, I think that uh, the Civil 3D uh, by the Autodesk and uh, the Revit software is very well known in the world. The Bentley company now is integrating the uh, list of softwares and uh, I think that uh, it is uh, able to uh, combine many types of the geometrical characterization of the structures by the microstation software. And of course, uh, for example, Bentley uh, has bought the company the Fluxis from the Netherlands and newly bought the LeapFrog from New Zealand and try to combine this information to the complex, the geobeam interpretation of those data. And of course, uh, there is this described the rapid information. So uh, the uh, basic is to combine the information about the shapes of the structure, uh, about the uh, classification of the structure elements, uh, the paramet parameters about the structure elements, and of course the prediction of the of the properties and behavior. Yes, in uh, some uh, influence from the outside. And of course, uh, the GeoBIM, uh, which is combination of uh, those worlds, the ground and the structure, uh, can uh, bring this information also about the ground. Yeah. Uh, these are the examples uh, by the pictures from the GoCat. Now it is combining yes, the Squa GoCat most, I think, developed uh, the geological software for the three-dimensional modeling of the ground and uh, any others Czech geological survey use the MOVE software for example for the uh, complex three-dimensional representation of the rock environment for example for the 
uh, nuclear waste repositories here in Czech Republic or for the structure, structure studies. Uh, in the United States, it's very well known the so the rock work for the uh, representation of the uh, ground. Uh, the bottom picture here in this presentation is done by the so the leap rock, which I provided for the part of the rock environment here in Czech Republic, northern of the Brno. Also, the uh, Bentley systems uh, covers the GNT software for the generation of the three dimensional models about the rock environment in Czech Republic and also all over the world is known the GO5 software for the uh, representation of the rock environment and of course the simulation of the um, behavior of this. And of course, you know the ArcGIS software, which is, uh, I think, all over the world very well known and is for the surface studies, geomorphological studies, and now is also, uh, I think, combining the information uh, from the underneath. Uh, why geophysical measurement? I think that uh, it was mentioned before, because when we have only the uh, borehole information, so it is uh, only from the specific points, yeah? while the geophysical measurements are continuous. They can uh, bring the information in a profile, yes, which are presented here, for example. Uh, this is the same rock environment uh, represented by the uh, geophysical image uh, from the ground penetration radar measurement and the same place, which is uh, from the uh, electrical resistivity tomography measurements and uh, you can see here very well the surface of the specific layer this is the quaternary uh, sediment uh, sedimentary environment and this is the surface of the uh, tertiary layers and here this um, resistive environment is done by the former uh, mine workings yes for the exploitation of the gypsum in this place is the in the North Moravia region. And uh, when we uh, are able to uh, give in some terrain uh, several these two-dimensional measurement, uh, measurements, we can uh, put it together over the terrain or in the terrain, but better for the representation is over the terrain for the orientation in the space. And uh, as a fence diagram, you can uh, represent it as a approximately three-dimensional imagination of the uh, ground conditions in this place. This is not my measurement, but I only interpret it uh, the, as a fence diagram, the seismic measurements in some uh, place in the Republic uh, where it was um, given some landslide over the highway here. So uh, what about uh, for the, I think, very good understanding of the conditions in place of the future construction? Uh, we uh, need to prepare so-called so the conceptual engineering geological model, which uh, covers uh, the geomorphological con uh, conditions, uh, which can be very well, uh, I think, uh, observed by the Satellite technologies, the um, airplane or the drone technologies, the LIDAR technologies, the photogrammetric, and uh, in very, very precise or very, very precise way. Uh, hydrological conditions can be also uh, studied very well by those technologies, uh, which are very, very precise, but the geological conditions, so the conditions of the rock environment are uh, or can be studied only by the geophysical as indirect methods or the geological, traditional geological methods, so by the digging or the drilling technology. But uh, we have to also study the tectonical situation in the place, uh, which is uh, in the relation, for example, for the uh, propagation of the elastic waves uh, and, of course, the hydrogeological conditions because also the groundwater influences the foundations of the structures. 
and the stability of the terrain underneath the structure. And of course, the engineering geological, so it means the engineering properties of the ground for the, or in the context as an interaction with the structure or the structural elements. And of course, uh, very, very useful is also the historical development, yeah? historical development of the place of the structure. Uh, uh, I prepared only very briefly two case studies how we can use the geophysical measurements for the study of the specific problems. The first one is the castle. Krimkovice is a four kilometers southwest from the Ostrava. And uh, the problem uh, which was described here was uh, the uh, potential existence of the underground spaces. Uh, under the ground floor here, and of course the problems of the moisture content or the uh, wetness of the ground floor and the walls there. And uh, uh, we decided to use the geophysical measurements because the uh, information from the boreholes were was very rare, and the boreholes, the closed boreholes, the archive boreholes were. Uh, I think in long distances from the structure. So uh, we prepared uh, at first the uh, georeferenced uh, plan of the structure put uh, on the terrain, uh, try to prepare the conceptual model of the uh, ground conditions. Uh, they are the quaternary layers and the tertiary layers there, but the ground of the castle is composed of the quaternary layers represented by the lowest loams and the still as a glacial sediments here. And uh, we prepare a uh, scheme of the uh, measurement profile. So uh, these are the profiles for the uh, electrical resistivity measurements here. And uh, by the blue lines, there are the measurement profiles for the ground penetrating radar measurement. And uh, these are only the pictures. This is the apparatus of the ground penetrating radar, Mala Geosciences, uh, the production, the uh, high frequency antenna, 500 megahertz, the monitor and the control in backpack. And this is the arrangement of one, one profile uh, by the electrical resistivity measurements, uh, which we provided uh, together with my colleague uh, Aleš Poláček on this picture. Uh, by the EPR measurements, uh, we uh, defined the place uh, where was uh, discovered the uh, cellar, historical cellar in the structure underneath the floor basement uh, here. And uh, it is visible here in the, as a reflected lines, reflected lines, which covers here along the wall, uh, the, here, the part, upper part of the ceiling of the, of the, uh, buried, buried, uh, I can say gallery. This is the example, uh, of the, uh, electrical resistivity measurements where it is visible very well the difference in conductivity of the uh, ground, uh, and uh, it means, uh, as uh, you know, uh, the conductivity of the soil is uh, in relation to the moisture content. So uh, where we uh, see the blue color, so it means is the more conductive part of the rock environment. And uh, uh, here it is visible that uh, the more conductive part are forming the channel yes, underneath the structure here. So it means it's the preferred zone of the ground uh, water flow underneath the structure because the sloping of the uh, terrain is from the left to the right side here on this picture. And uh, it was very well visible here because this is the uh, what west view on the structure and uh, here there are the uh, ERT profiles and you can see here perfectly the blue places here 
it means the potential this is the behind the structure from this side view and this is in the middle of the structure uh, through the courtyard of the castle and uh, here the, there are the places of the formation of the potential groundwater low channel and uh, this diagram is a diagram uh, which was done by the measurements uh, several years ago where the uh, colleagues uh, measured the moisture content yes in the uh, wall of this west side of the castle and you can see that the most moisture content in the wall is approximately in the same uh, way as the high conductive materials in the soil in the ground so it means this is the a very good relation of the moisture content which is uh, by the uh, rising of the uh, moisture content through the uh, through the uh, ground up to the basement of the structure so it was very very useful for the uh, reconstruction work here the second uh, case study is uh, from the football stadium in ostrava very famous uh, the place is called Bazali. Uh, the, the name of this place uh, is in relation to the geological environment because the Bazali, it means the basalt place. Yes, so it means it was the formerly quarry for the extraction of the basalt for the construction of works uh, in Ostrava and surroundings. And uh, the problem was uh, that uh, the city hall of Ostrava would like to uh, change uh, this place for the other utilization uh, for the construction of the new building there. But the problem is Ostrava as a mining city is uh, that after the mining and uh, undermining of the uh, city, uh, there were, there are, not there were, there are problems with the uh, methane emanation. Uh, this is very, very dangerous. Yeah. And undermining, undermining uh, position of the old mine workings, yes, and the vertical movements uh, according some faults which are in the uh, uh, rock basement, and of course uh, on the uh, slopes uh, they are somewhere also the landslide, and in this place uh, they are combined together all these negative, I can say, uh, events or the hazard from the ground for the future construction. Uh, these are only the historical uh, images of the extraction of the basalt uh, boulders uh, which were uh, formed here uh, during the tertiary volcanic activity before the water sedimentation. And uh, this is the position of the uh, studied area the Basali Stadium yes and the training training place here and uh, this is the uh, historical plan of the old mine working and we georeferenced uh, this uh, historical uh, image according to the position of this very special edit for the dewatering of the mining region here which was georeferenced here in the picture and these are any other yes edits which are very close to the surface and uh, there are very, very, uh, or precisely underneath the stadium. And this place uh, is the uh, surface slumping, yes, uh, during the uh, floods in uh, 1997 in Ostrava. And uh, we decided for the discovering of the potential mine workings here to realize uh, several uh, geophysical measurements. Here there are the profiles for the electrical resistivity measurements. And uh, by the blue line, there were also realized the uh, ground penetration radar measurements, but uh, with the lower frequencies, 100 megahertz antenna. And uh, what are the results? Uh, very. I think impressive that are the results from the electrical resistivity measurement. Uh, this is the diagonal profile here with the uh, resistive maximum here uh, in this place. So it means somewhere here 
also very close to the former slumping of the surface uh, in the grass of the football stadium. And uh, this is this line yes, of the measurement and also with the maximum of the resident, uh, resistance here. So uh, we are able to put also here, or we were able to realize the measurement here in the training place. And there are also the maximum of the resistivity here, very close to the surface. Yeah? And uh, it is in relation in, uh, I think, three-dimensional representation, because uh, here there is a uh, old mine workings very close to the surface, yes, which is a very danger for the future construction. And uh, I would like, before the conclusion, to start uh, the representation yes, of the uh, Google Earth, because uh, it was very successful, uh, by my opinion, that for the decision makers, yes, uh, we would like to uh, present uh, those results of the geophysical measurements, I think, uh, accessible for the understanding uh, for the people who are not, uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, traditionally uh, used those two-dimensional representation uh, and, yeah. So I need uh, because it is an export of the data uh, from the from the Rockwell software, and uh, here there are the several types of the measurements. And for example, I can uh, show you the representation of those geophysical measurements in real. So we can use it and turn the terrain. Uh, it is georeferenced, yes, and uh, you can use it perfectly with the terrain and. You see that here it was the historical slumping, yes, 25 years ago, and uh, we identified the mine working here. And of course, I will turn it a little bit. And the mine working is going in this way, yes, uh, underneath the stadium. And uh, I can change it from the electrical resistivity profile uh, for the uh, profile in the position of the 300, 50 megahertz, 50 megahertz in the grafter antenna. And of course, we prepared for the decision maker the position uh, with the red dot here uh, is a, uh, the borehole for the degradation of the terrain. Yes, there are many other there. And of course, the representation of the GPR yes, measurement. It is not clear here because it's a bad resolution of the picture. But in some, I think the closure, you can see here also some reflections. Yes, some reflections very close to the surface is a hyperbolic reflection. Uh, which are done by the uh, some galleries, and here it's not, not so visible perfectly, but here there are the other, yes, in a original resolution. Yeah? So this is a very, very good representation uh, of the uh, geophysical measurements and the geophysical images uh, to the real ground for the future uh, construction. Yes, I would like to go back. And can I ask you for the for the PowerPoint presentation back? I only say I only say several words about the conclusions. So the problem is with the uh, representation of the ground and uh, yeah, the this one. Thank you very much. Uh, because the geophysical measurements are continuous, not only the point measurement, yes, in the ground. And of course, the geophysical measurements can be realized also, especially in urban areas, yes, in a places where it is not possible to drill downhole, yes, to the uh, ground, for example, for the uh, some pipes and so on. And of course, uh, we would like to discover some properties and we can discover, uh, for example, some moisture content in the ground by the electrical properties of the ground. Yes. And of course, uh, this is also useful for the uh, maintenance of the structure because we are able to use those measurements also for the realization of some uh, investigation focused on some problems with the structure. Yeah. And of course, when we will store this information uh, in a comprehensive model from the investigation phase for the future structure through the construction realization up to the maintenance of the structure, so we can save the money because uh, those information, this information is very useful and, of course, uh, is a, uh, in some cases very expensive. So this is the formation of the GeoBIM. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution. I, um, I'm afraid it must the question wait for coffee break because we are late according to the program. Then I immediately ask the last speaker with a contribution methodology.
history of seismic blasting in quarries, which is partly similar to the <laughs> previous one. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ivan Buchwa. I work working for the Carnot uh, companies, which is uh, the mining companies. And our general job is uh, burning of the line. And we very often cooperate with the technical university. And uh, we bring uh, together with the technical university of this presentation, which is methodology of the same blast in the world. As I told, uh, we are uh, mining uh, companies and more mining companies using for the extraction material the um, blasting the works. Uh, and these blasting works have the positive and neg negative effect. The positive is the uh, technical uh, advantages, uh, cost effective, fragmentation, so and heavy and digitality. On the other side is negative, which is the ground vibration, dust and noise, air overpressure, air blast, fly rock, and damage uh, natural phenomena. Uh, dust and uh, noise we can uh, control in by uh, special uh, equipment or, or tools. It means that we can use uh, for uh, decreasing the noise uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some uh, some material which can block the uh, losing lose energy from the hole and dust, uh, for example, to covering uh, the blast holes or to scrapping. But generally, we have the problem with the vibration. Virtually, all blasting. Uh, seismic are created by a combination of the three basic input parameters and their uh, material uh, interaction. It is um, source of vibration, uh, transmission environment, and uh, receptor. On the next slide, on this slide is, uh, the, for example, of the preparation of the blasting, which is really important for the fragmentation, for example. And uh, uh, these parameters are set up by uh, blasting, uh, blasting sheet or, technic or uh, technical blasters. Uh, these parameters are uh, basically uh, set up by, by experience and uh, their feeling. Uh, here is um, some, uh, some uh, preparation of the blasting, where is the parameters important as the burden, the spacing, hold it, or uh, sub drilling, and plus uh, using and, uh, the slope. Is, uh, uh, if uh, uh, it's different if we charge uh, each hole uh, with explosive and uh, we blast in the one time, uh, the effect for the object we are, which are uh, new to the uh, quarries can be as a static effect. And uh, as I told, if we blast this uh, hole in the one time, the effect is higher than we blast in the delay. Uh, uh, as to be sure that uh, we are in the, we have the good parameter uh, in the field is the uh, digitalization of the, of the, our job. It means that uh, the digitalization of the, of the area, what is interesting for the preparation blasting by preparation of the 3D model. We using for the, these are uh, the drone and the photogrammetry. Uh, no, we decided uh, five years ago uh, for, uh, for this method because we com compare method uh, uh, collecting data by, by the laser scanner or by uh, total station. But, uh, uh, but the utilization of the drone and photogrammetry is for our best because it is cheaper and the quality is uh, really too high. If we have the 3D model, this uh, model we can transfer to the special software, which is built for us, for the miners. And this software can provide uh, to us uh, an identified zone where is uh, the uh, for example, here is the green zone where the parameters are good, or we are in the parameters what we set up and we talk to the software. And red zone is represent the zone where is the high energy and there, there is the result of the fly rock. And uh, uh, blue zone is a uh, is, um, uh, area where is uh, less energy and there is the risk for fragmentation and going to more energy to the uh, rock environment means it can affect it to the object on the near to the, to the quarries. If we have 3D models and we have uh, uh, identified some, uh, some uh, places where is, where is the high energy or the less energy, the software can predict for us the best position of the holes to represent this picture. But on the left side is what we prefer it, and on the other side is reality. We know that the, the method of the drilling can, uh, can affect it on the deviation. It's positive or negative deviation. If you have the positive uh, deviation, the burden is less. If you have negative, the burden is more, and it can affect it to the seismic. And be sure that uh, we are in the parameters, what we set up, we use for the controlling this, uh, the probe, which can uh, uh, measuring and mapping of the trajectory of the real position of the drillet holes. And then this data, we can uh, combine with the 3D model and software can show to us the real 3D model with the real 3D uh, position of the hole. This information is very useful for our, for the, our, our the blaster because they can adapt uh, the 
construction of the of the holes. They can change the explosive. They can add some some uh, holes, or they can reducing some explosive in the holes for the for to be sure that uh, parameters what was drilled is uh, really uh, in the in the other parameters. Uh, as I told, uh, it's really important the timing between the holes to holes, and um, and uh, we know for the theory that if uh, the millisecond timing between the holes is uh, higher than the 250 millimeters, the vibration attenuation is by itself before the next subcharge uh, before the next subcharge explodes. Uh, on the left uh, graph is a uh, graph of the pressure wave caused during the explosion. And there is the showing the maximum compressive stress when firing a one barrel hole, then less uh, 2.5, 2.5 milliseconds. Therefore, or it means that uh, the timing between holes must be uh, 2.5 to 250 millimeters. But the question is, uh, where is, uh, where is the, uh, the, where is the best option for the, for the timing and existing formula where, uh, Delay of drilling of individual bare holes is determined by structural properties of the rock environment. And these properties, uh, it means that it is a uh, velocity of saving waste uh, propagation in the rock environment. And uh, these uh, properties we can measure by teralog. And the output from the teralog is uh, represented in the picture on the right side. Uh, teralog is equipment which have uh, 24 uh, of sensors. And these sensors are collecting data in the, in the same time. Now that this uh, data, we can um, calculate the speed of the propagation and plus frequency. And then is valid the uh, formula delta t equals t by two, where the t is the period of the vibration of the waves. According to the theory on seismic waves propagation and attenuation, the biggest attenuation can be achieved at millisecond timing only if the waves generated by future blasts are in the opposite path. path. It means that the delta t equals 1 divided by 2 f, where the f is the frequency of the seismic waves. And we know that uh, this frequency we can measure by signal of, of this uh, equipment of the parallel. And if we know this information, we can apply in the formula. Uh, and in this case, it means that the uh, rock massive have frequency 30 uh, hertz. The best uh, timing between the charge to charge is uh, 70 milliseconds. And then we know that uh, this uh, attenuation starting to be behind 70 meters. If we have frequency, frequency, for example, uh, 24 hertz, the best timing is uh, 20 milliseconds and attenuation is happening to 86 meters behind of the blast. Okay, we, we know the timing, but very important is to uh, the charge. Uh, detonation of the explosive charge always has very strong impact in the environment. Uh, rock environment can be air, water, soil, rock part of structure. structure. In the case of the blasting war, it is mainly the transform transmission of the seismic wave through to the rock environment. Existing theoretical relationship between effect and cause between the two variables, uh, the value of the peak particle velocity PTV and reducing distance LR. And then is a valid formula where the V is equals uh, distance divided by uh, quantity to uh, 0 0.5, where the V is uh, the peak of the particle velocity, which is maximum component of the vibration velocity uh, generated by the blast, and L divided by Q to 0 0.5 is a reducing distance. It means that uh, collecting data near to the to the blast, uh, uh, it is 25 meters. We have one seismograph, and uh, collecting data we can inter interpret in the graph, where in the axis uh, x is a reduction of the distance, and uh, axis uh, y is a peak particle velocity. And um, here is a data uh, collected to the near to the blast by seismograph, where we know uh, the, the peak uh, particle velocity where we know the distance and we know the quantity of the explosive. On the base of this information, we can um, write or, or put uh, uh, data in the graph. And then, plus, uh, we know if we have the second seismograph on the receptor, where we can collect the same data, it means that the PTV and, uh, and on the base uh, distance and quantity of the expo explosion, we can uh, uh, put this data in the graph. And existing, existing, existing the law attenuation and correlation between these data. And, and uh, for example, in our quarry or in our company was set up uh, the parameters maximally three millimeters per uh, uh, second, uh, uh, which is maximally uh, saving effect of, on the object near to the our quarries, which uh, can be maximally. And if we know that uh, these three millimeters is uh, here, we can get the, the reducing distance with the number of the people. It means that 
the graphic dependent, dependence of the maximum component of the peak particle velocity on the reducing distance during the bench or blast in the quarry, then a lot of the attenuation of the seismic waves. And the red line uh, indicated the maximum of safe allowed peak particle velocity of, of the buildings in the village. And then if we know the reducing distance on the base um, other, uh, other formula where the Q equals the L uh, to two by divide by L reduction by two, uh, where the Q max is maximally quantity per uh, delay and the uh, L is distance uh, from, uh, from uh, blast to the uh, seismograph and the LR is a reduction of the distance. On the base of this formula, we can uh, calculate maximally charge rate per uh, bare volume. It means if we have distance from the blasting to the receptor 100 meters, maximally what we can use for the for the timing is four kilograms of the explosive. If we have distance between the uh, the initiation or epicentrum of the seismic to the receptor uh, 500 meters, on the base of this formula, we can predict that the maximally charge for the timing is uh, 100 uh, kilogram of the explosive. And calculation of the maximum permissible charge weight per bare hole, depending on the distance during a repeated uh, bench blasting in the quarry when uh, applying the method. And uh, let me summarize uh, my information, what was presented. The presented methodology makes uh, it possible to reduce the negative effect of the vibration into the safe level. And then uh, knowing to the propagation of the velocity and dominant frequency in the rock uh, environment, on the, uh, this information, we can set up millisecond, uh, millisecond time delay between the one charge to, to second charge. And then if we know the low attenuation of seismic waves in the rock massive, and uh, we can uh, set up a maximum of the charges per, per hole. This uh, methodology was applied in the each hour uh, quarries, and uh, not only uh, in the hour quarries, but, uh, but was uh, implemented in the other quarries in the Slovakia, and uh, uh, this methodology, it works. Uh, we started to cooperate with the Technical University eight years ago, and uh, we had really problem with the fire and with the seismic effect on the protected building the, near to the outer quarry. And when we applied this, uh, this methodology, we didn't uh, receive uh, some um, comp complaints from the people in the village, and, and uh, we really to found and uh, set up uh, real parameters for the outer blasting. Uh, it is uh, uh, finished my presentation, uh, but uh, I I have a plus uh, one video about how we do the photogrammetry and how we use the, the special equipment for the preparation of the blasting. And let me show this uh, video. Thanks a lot for your attention. And thank you very much. And it is the last one in this section. We are now moving our position to the next session chair.